we've done it. We've gone live and with a brand new version of OBS as well. This is 26.1.2, which I got to say has uh, a lot of neat features. Unfortunately, one of which is the tendency to occasionally crash when displaying dialog boxes for reasons I'm not entirely sure about. Um, I want to say it has something to do with stuff that I've read about how unstable the Linux the web browser plugin is that the this build actually uses. Um, but in any case, hello, fellas of Blind Picks Fanatics, welcome to the first live stream of 2020. First things first, uh, this is the first live stream, should technically be the second, but the first live stream of the year uh, did not happen uh, last week. It wasn't going to be on Tuesday, it was going to be on Wednesday because I had some uh, stuff that I had to get done on Tuesday. Uh, and then uh, late Tuesday evening and mostly for several days up to and including now i was just feeling uh incredibly run down so the stream didn't happen on wednesday because uh after i took the puppy for a walk i sat down with him on the couch to give him his after walk treat and actually sort of fell asleep and didn't wake up until 10 sitting up no less and the whole week has kind of been uh, a lot of that uh being very well, getting sleep and but waking up not feeling rested, I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. I also had a little bit of a tickle in the back of my throat uh, for a brief period yesterday, but that seems to have gone away, so that's good. But uh, it is what it is. I apologize. I should have said something, but I was frankly just too tired. So we're here uh, in this. So the first thing we want to say is uh, I'm not entirely sure what will happen, but should OBS actually crash on us tonight, I will uh, fire things up again if I can. I I think, I think if the stream goes away and then comes back, uh, YouTube will just recommence streaming to the same area. I'm not entirely sure. This never actually happened before. I've managed to you know, run this for a long period of time without actually having any crashes, so we'll see. Uh, which is why this stream is the, the chill stream, uh, if you will. And you can actually see behind me here some of the uh, new accoutrement, if you will. Uh, right back there, we can see the uh, the tripod, what I use to uh, put up my camera when I'm filming in the area in the back there. And that right there is it's hard to point like that with the reversal. That eh, is the monitor. Good evening, Ashwin, uh, that I actually use to uh, monitor the camera. Um, we'll see how long that goes because this monitor to the right of me here is sort of a duplicate of that one it's before I got this newer, slightly bigger one. Every now and then it just sort of goes black for a while and comes back. And I'm not entirely sure what the reason for that is. Um, and it's probably very hard to tell, but uh, <laughs> there's a thin black line that is one of the two light stands there. The other one is way over by the guitar. Uh, they're actually, the uh, the light hoods are such that you can't actually see them. But believe it or not, uh, those two lights are the only lights that I have uh, set up to do videos now on the channel starting this year. Uh, and I film this time at night. There's you know, there's a window right there. There's no light coming in there unless a car happens to drive by. So they are incredibly bright. Unfortunately, slightly too bright because there's a reflection on my glasses. I'm trying to figure a way to solve that. But uh, there's really no way to get that one any farther away from me than it is. But the the it's in a pretty good position. It's that one over there that's a little bit too close. It's the one that's keying me from the front and causing the shine on the glasses. Uh, but in order to get rid of that, I'd have to take the two bookcases that are on the wall behind it down and toss them out uh, and then try to figure out a place to store all my books and other nerd stuff. So space is kind of constrained. We'll see what we can do. Hello, Koya Anna Squatsy. I'm just going to call you Koi. Hello. <laughs> uh, welcome to the stream. Ah, so I'm not sure if you are here uh, previously. Um, I'm using a brand new version of OBS. I managed to solve most of the problems I was having with getting it to compile and run. Fortunately, it does have the occasional tendency to seg fault itself out of existence, but only if I try to interact with uh, dialogue and 
I don't usually touch anything over there, so hopefully things should be good. But uh, that's why I thought this would be like a chill stream. There's a couple of things that I'd like to work on, including the project-specific keys. Uh, basically, I'm trying to go through my user package and uh, my packages directory and find all of the packages that we worked on uh, and the plugins that we worked on for streams last year and actually get them out of my user package because it's... It's getting wildly out of control in there, guys. So we're going to work on that. But first, uh, a plugin that I've been meaning to work on, something to open the, the Sublime plugin files directly out of the uh, installation directory on Sublime. So let's go ahead and uh, get into it. And uh, a couple of uh, new things here. Uh, I have a brand new introduction. I mean, it looks the same as the other one, sort of, kind of, but I recreated it. So we'll see how well it works here. I mean, it worked good in testing, but things usually do, don't they? <laughs> Hello, fellow Sublime Text Fanatics. Hopefully that wasn't uh, shockingly loud. Believe it or not, I actually, in this new version, cut the volume down by seven or eight decibels because the other one always seemed slightly too loud for me. Of course, this also seems like it didn't actually go anywhere, but I'm pretty sure it is actually quieter. Um, the original one of those was something I created back in 2018 in Blackmagic Fusion, but... I have ditched that in favor of HitFilm Pro, which I've been using for a year for other things. I thought it's about time to actually do something with that so I can uh, update my introduction. And uh, that is what I came up with. It didn't take very long to reproduce that, and it's actually ridiculously easy to change it now. So in theory, I could make a custom one for every video if I wanted to. Um, so here we are, uh, and this is the... Uh, I can't remember which live stream this was, but if we look here, live stream 57 was when we worked on this particular package, and we're currently on live stream 81 at, you know, one live stream a week. That is a ways back. I remember Ashwin was here when we worked on this one. The idea behind this particular package, uh, as the uh, readme says here, and this is actually... This repository should actually be uh, up on my GitHub page. I just haven't uh, linked to it anywhere yet because there's a little bit more stuff I'd like to do. Uh, it allows you to add an entry like ya yeah, into your uh, Sublime project file to have key bindings that are specific to your project. And what it'll actually do is something uh, akin to this, uh, which is create a key map file uh, inside of the packages folder with the key bindings that come out of this thing. Uh, with this custom context added that comes from the package, um, which uh, makes the key binding active only in particular packages. So there's a couple of things to do with this. The, the bigger one, uh, in order to make this actually useful in the general case, is the stuff we talked about at the end of said live stream, and I believe it's uh, here in the readme. These are, right now, it always assumes that these key bindings are for the current platform, but I personally use Sublime on Linux and on Windows and on Mac OS, gesturing to computers that are out of your range of vision here. So there is the conceivability that if I was gonna use this package, I might want different key bindings because I tend to use super for things under Linux and I tend to use super for key bindings for a lot of things under Mac OS. Uh, on Windows, not quite as much because the super key is the Windows key and Windows itself, uh, I, I say steals a lot of the key bindings associated with that particular key. So a lot of them don't work and there's no way to stop it from doing so as far as I've never been able to find out. So we're gonna work on trying to uh, get that little bit of thing going in a way similar to how menus work. But uh, one thing that I would like to do uh, would be if we were to go to this directory inside of this uh, directory here, which is where my this particular copy of uh, Sublime is called, uh, execute or installed, I will say, but uh, it's actually a sim link to build 4094 because uh, as we all know, I am a hoarder of Sublime text versions and I have every version of Sublime 4 and most of the versions of Sublime 3 sitting inside my home local directory. Uh, inside of this directory, there's this folder named lib. And inside here, we got the Python 33 and the Python 38 bits. And uh, there's Sublime plugin and Sublime plugin.py. If you're unaware, these are the files that actually uh, associate with 
these, the uh, import Sublime and import Sublime plugin. This is the actual source of those files. So in the you know world of the purely theoretical, if you modify these and then restart Sublime, you could make changes to how its API works. You could add your own stuff in there. I mean, not a great thing to do because it would only work for you, but not entirely possible. And we look at these uh, frequently when working on things to investigate uh, bits of the API and how they work. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat if there was a plugin to uh, allow you to quickly open this thing? Because uh, otherwise, you got to find it in here and open it. And of course, uh, whoops, maybe I'll give the focus back to the area that I think has it. The other one in these, Python 38, is the exact same files, but for the other plugin host. So what we can do is uh, make something that just loads up these files and probably match them as read-only to make sure that we can't actually save them. Um, more alternatively, we could open the file and grab the content out and dump it into a buffer or something. But you know, maybe we might want to change it, and uh, then we could work around that. Now, the key to this whole operation is uh, quick panel, which we know how to do, and sublime executable path, uh, which gives you, as the name suggests, the full path up to and including the executable of Sublime Text. Hang on, let me just take this off so we don't go crazy with it sliding on the desk. Um, so this is, and note also that this is the the real path version of this, if you will, because this is actually this is actually where it's stored. Uh, but as we see here, it's not. It's symlinked in here. Now that way I can just uh, flip the link around to get to any version I like. Uh, so we take this, pull that part off, append the other stuff, find that st uh, those files quickly and easily. Uh, and Ashwin says, looks like package dev finally got released for Sublime 4. Yeah, I noticed that earlier. In fact, uh, <laughs> I thought that that had happened a ways back, actually. Uh, primarily because of that whole uh, it start up Sublime 4, and then it would say, this package isn't compatible with this, and then it would uninstall and reinstall, and then I'd switch to Sublime Text 3 to help somebody on the forum, and then it would say, hey, this is not a good version for this, and it would uninstall and reinstall. Uh, I guess that was related to something else. I'm not entirely clear on what exactly happened there, but uh, I haven't actually done anything with it yet. It actually updated itself as I was starting Sublime, as I was getting ready for... Uh, the stream here. Uh, <laughs> so let's go ahead and close this for just a moment so we can do the standard thing. Oh, actually, um, that's not the thing. I have a key binding that I set up that I never tend to use. Whoops. Uh, Alt Shift N. Oh, I did control alt uh, to set up the uh, the layout that I normally use a little bit easier. Uh, but you know, I tend to work in the same window so frequently uh, that I haven't actually set that up recently. So let's say we want a new plugin. Um, we're gonna say what what's what would this be like? Browse. Should we do this with an input handler or with a quick panel? Because I was thinking quick panel, but maybe that's not what we want. Uh, my speakers are making uh, annoying rumble sounds. Uh, maybe we could use an input handler instead, and then it could provide you a list of all of the files. I was sort of thinking of the idea that the quick panel would open and ask you plug in host 3.3 or 3.8, and then you pick, and then it... Uh, shows you the two files and you can open one or the other but maybe we want an input handler for that hmm. we'll call this the open api files command and we'll assume it's going to be a window command i also ashman am tempted to say input handler the thing that's kind of slowing me down is not getting that sweet sweet kind info in there yet but uh I don't know that that's necessarily anything that we really need here. <laughs> 
if 4095 drops while the stream is on and I don't notice it in the Discord, say something in the chat, and I, I can be quitting out of this and downloading a new version and untarballing it into this directory in a matter of moments. As a matter of fact, maybe I'll just click this and see. I've been sort of thinking that it's probably, I mean, they've said that uh, it could be happening at any point now. And the fact that, you know, it makes one suspicious that both Ben and uh, John and David are all hanging out in the Discord. Well, I mean, David's away and John's away, but uh, when there's multiple Sublime developers hanging around on Discord and I hear word that Will has been furiously merging pull requests in the packages repository, uh, which I believe is something someone said, starts to get real suspicious about a new build dropping. Speaking of, related to things that happened in November, we actually uh, were discussing the idea of covering Sublime 4 on the channel, and I didn't want to do that without uh, touching base with John to make sure he was okay with it, and I have done that, and uh, he is uh, he is okay with that. So that is definitely a thing that's happening. Just have to decide what order for things to go in. Um. <laughs> ben uh, Ashwin says Ben seems to be hanging all the time. I don't think he sleeps. Could say the same thing about me, although technically speaking. For the last, well, not for the last few days, because the last few days I've actually been going to bed at a reasonable time and sleeping a lot longer than I normally do, but still not feeling any rested. But for a long while there, I was going to bed at like one o'clock in the morning or so, and then waking up at six or five on the weekends. So, but uh, he also, don't forget, is in Australia. So his time zone is all wibbledy wobbledy in some way that I don't quite understand. But as far as I can remember, it's already probably tomorrow evening for him or something ridiculous. I remember uh, for work, because we deal with stock data, we have uh, a file vendor that gives us end of day prices for Australia. And I think they arrive at like five o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, actually. Uh, Eastern time, as he said, uh, sorry, that is not the right one. It's probably ASX, isn't it? Yeah, I bet you it is. They're GMT plus 10, so I guess they're two hours ahead of everybody else, but, uh, yeah, the market opens uh, for our system at one o'clock in the morning uh, in Eastern time. So things get real tricky real fast, uh, especially when it comes around the time where daylight savings time happens because it happens at a different time uh, than everywhere else. One of those things that makes time zones a terrible, terrible thing. So... What arguments would we provide to this bad boy? Uh, let's say we say file, and what we do is just open the file. So let's open up the help here. We would use this, open the name file, return the corresponding view. If the file is already opened, it will be brought to the front. Do, do, do. So we're going to want an event listener in this thing as well. I think their planned M1 build is taking a lot longer than expected. Possibly. Pardon me. Um, have they said, I guess they have said that they're working on it, right? So I assume they actually have gotten uh, themselves uh, their hands on one. I think the statistical outlier there is a lot of other bigger, mostly, now that I think about it, mostly creative style software vendors like Adobe with all of their stuff and Serif with their uh, Illustrator and photo and publishing tools got, I think got themselves on the, uh, the train of uh, getting development versions of the hardware so that they could be ready to launch right when it became available and the sublime developers 
didn't do that because I can't remember. Will said something about there, you know, being like a fairly large cost involved in that or something, and who knows how many of them they'd actually need. I've never actually uh, tested the, well, because I don't have the appropriate stuff, the ARM64 builds for Linux in general, but I assume those are probably, you know, also something that needs to get working too. So what we would probably do. Just sort of uh, spitballing how this would work because I haven't really given it, you know, that much thought. But you know, we're here to uh, we're here to <laughs> just uh, hang and get back into the swing of things and make sure that this version of OBS isn't going to blow up or anything. Um, speaking of, um, I uh, along with the other drops that we have on the stream, should we become uh, absolutely perplexed about? why something doesn't seem to work, which, you know, based on that uh, that stream where we were working on phantoms and never quite got things going, I created a new drop. So you can tell me what you think of the volume level on this one, if it seems roughly level. It seems to be based on the meters, but sometimes the meters lie. And it displays weird in the window, but it displays correctly as far as I can see in recordings and on the stream. But... Uh, that might actually be too quiet. I'm not sure. In any case, hey, hey, right on. And uh, those work too. I uh, was trying to keep an eye out for the thirds. Um, so, yeah, this video, trying to you know, just keep it chill, especially since uh, all of the two, two streams a week in December. Uh, really, uh, it was a lot of fun, but whoo, having the... Uh, the pressure, if you will, of actually having set tasks and trying to get them done. It's kind of like working. Hi, guy. The pooch has decided to grace us with his presence. I'm not, you probably can't see him sneaking into the room, uh, but his gassiness precedes him, if you will. Um, What we're going to do is something like this. This is Python. Um, basically, this is a very simplistic thing that it has to do, right? All the rest of the work is going to happen elsewhere. If file, no. Oops. File not in args. We'll set that up for now. And uh, it's pretty much all we uh, realistically need. The only reason that this is its own command is so that we can use an input handler and so that we can apply that setting. Um, This is going to be a view event listener because what we're going to do is listen for the on load of files that have that setting and make them read only and then remove the setting. Right? And if the setting make read only is set, we apply. Um, and all we really have to do here is say self dot view dot set read only true and self dot view dot settings dot set uh, dot erase make read only thusly. Now that is completely off the top of my head as something that might actually happen. So if we wanted to double check, uh, view event listeners do in fact listen for on load. So that's nice. And uh, is applicable, totally takes settings, so that's nice. And I believe we looked up open file, and uh, it takes the name of the file, so cool. I guess the only thing we didn't actually test is, we're gonna play it like that, are we? Input, do, do, do. 
No, no, no. I should have just done it uh, the other way, shouldn't I? Right on. Okay. So, here is our class uh, file input handler. Sublime plugin. Let's say list input handler is the thing that we want here. We don't need to provide this any particular arguments, but what we do need to do is say return. Is this how you create a class? Good graciousness. Yeah, the, uh, the Ashwin said the snappy quick panel could also use some kind goodness. I tend to agree. Um, there is, oh, I could just use one of those keys. The table of contents has some stuff. Normally we look at the index, but I'd love to have sort of, uh, I'm not entirely sure how to separate out the the kind items, um, but I'd love to make this shorter by being able to take advantage of how we can display information over there for say what the actual link is since it doesn't actually go anywhere. And then this could conceivably maybe even have a little tiny blurb of help or something. Totally on the list of things to do. At some point during the year, we're going to cycle back to doing a bunch of work on Snappy. For right now, uh, I'd probably hyper help too, as a matter of fact. But for right now, I'm not doing that because most of the changes that I want to make in Snappy have to do with the documentation, which hasn't been finalized yet. Or at least it hasn't been uploaded, assuming my cron job still works. Uh, but after that happens, yeah, I want to do a bunch of stuff with that. This could be the year that it actually gets released in a way where it's not just uh, inside of that one repository of things. Um, hmm. Interestingly, that is really weird. Uh, I changed the profile picture for the channel that I do live streams on to uh, a newer picture that I took and uh, slightly less orange in it, which is nice. The live stream that I set up is still using the old one, but the thing that said that reminded me that the live stream was going to happen is using the new one. And that's just weird. Uh, I don't understand you, YouTube. I don't understand you at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, who remembers how list input handlers work? We're not going to need a name. We're not going to need a description. Uh, we'll probably want a placeholder, I guess. Wouldn't it be absolutely swimming if the new build did work and we could use the input handler to say uh, that oh, pardon me, the, uh, the plugin host that the thing is in could be slightly different. Uh, it could be uh, as a second item in the, the panel. Huh, that's going to be cool. Indeed, yeah, Ashwin's like, I never noticed that, so subtle. I also have recorded but haven't uh, finished editing and putting up channel new channel trailers for the both of the both channels in the new style, and I'm also working on refreshing the channel art as well. New year, new stuff. Uh, slow going, though, what with all of the sleeping that I've been doing lately. Um, initial text, we're not going to want anything. Preview, we're in, oh, no. We're not going to validate. We're not going to confirm. Okay, we're not we're not going to need anything other than that. All we're going to need is list items. So that's good. So, and that doesn't even take uh, any stuff. So that's nice. And we'll just return. And uh, we're not going to use the tuple version of this. I don't imagine. Well, maybe we will. Well, we'll see what we come up with. I guess we do because we want to pass the file, don't we? Um, so we probably want a little something like this. 
So that this would be the file that it opens, and this would be the description of the thing. Um, uh oh. Oh. I must have saved the file while I was working on it. Cool, cool. All right. So next phase of the operation is actually finding the files that we're interested in. So again, oh, actually, before we do that, I guess uh, one last thing. Something like, oh, check out the new... Uh, the new completions in override out or not in over in um, package dev pardon me hey hey application command window command text command nicey nicey Ooh, even telling you information about what it actually is. That's sweet. This could obviate some of the, uh, the, the stuff that I have here. I guess the real question is, override audit stuff appears in here. Browse commands does from command browser 33, but not the other one. There are two versions of that command. No, there's not. There's one. Um, hmm. Trying to think of packages that have commands. Yeah. Um, interesting. I'm guessing that it might still be running in the older plugin host. The only... Oh, well, I guess we could probably just do that packages that include that do not include package dev. So there's probably a little bit of more work to get that part going, but that's okay. I guess I could have tested that by seeing if this command appeared there, huh? All right, well, that totally works. Right on. Oh, actually, also, yeah, it's totally read-only right now. So, cool. We pulled all of that out of our butts, basically, and managed to get it to work. Rolling onwards. Um, not entirely sure how long we'll go tonight. At least the two hours, maybe a little bit longer. We'll see how I'm feeling. I've been trying to get a little bit more sleep. Perhaps I uh, spent too much time staying up late and that uh, messed me up. Um, so we might say, just for the test purposes here, we need to import OS because we're going to need that. And then... Base path would be equal to sublime dot executable path. And then we would probably print base path. Um, so we can actually see uh, what it's doing. Now is the part where uh, I'm doing stuff that I can't do off the top of my head because I don't work with files in Python all that frequently. Um, so we might say. Uh, the, will, the Astron's asking, would this be made public after the live stream? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, definitely at some point, but I can, I can endeavor to put it into a gist sooner than it will take me to go through all of the other stuff. Uh, indeed. Is this something that you're interested in? <laughs> I should have just used path for that. Uh, it seems like a handy thing to me. I do it more frequently than one would have thought. Absolute path, return the base name. The second element of the pair. Oh, is it just a, is it just a path split? Or is it just dir name and I'm being an idiot? I bet you I am. Let's check it out.
So now it is that. Cool. Okay. That's the base path. Um, then we need to actually look inside of there to the lib folder, right? This is where, how do we want to do this? I mean, one way to do this would be to actually have it look inside of there. Or we could assume, why is there a Python 3 in here, by the way? Ah, major version, nothing we technically care about here. Forgot the number of times I opened it in my personal plugins project and then closed it and then open recent files getting clobbered by other newly opened files. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. And the nice thing about doing it this way also is that it'll work cross-platform. Also, you could create a command palette entry that would open specific files too. Uh, the other thing that occurs here is to have this take a plugin host and then the name of a file so that you could browse into it a little bit easier. But there's only four files to open here, so I don't know that that's necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, but if we have the name of the executable path, then we need to os.path.join. Is that a thing? I swear. Yep, cool. And that would go to the lib. We're going to case it that way to make sure that everything works out. So cool. And this actually can't be uh, out here, obviously. This is just us testing this. Uh, although executable path might be, hmm. it's not specifically in the list of things that uh, can be called before the plugin host, but I wouldn't want to risk that anyway. Um, also, I probably wouldn't do it all in one big shot like this either, all things told. Um, probably say self dot uh, what we call it? Lib path would be this bit here. But notice that that's a little bit too long. So we might actually just go ahead and do something like this. You know, we like to, uh, whoops. So that oops. Oh, I see. I see what we did there. We we clipped it in the wrong place. So this will be the lib path. Now I guess up here we just throw in some sort of variable like hosts. Uh, there's nothing about <clears throat> to say there's no way to uh, detect how many plugin hosts there are in any conceivable way other than looking for files in the directory. Maybe we could do that. Let's see. I'm going to say what the heck? I mean, why not go all out? I mean, what are the, we could just hard code the two plugin hosts that we know that there's going to be, but uh, then at some point, a couple of years down the line, when there's a new one, uh, we'd have to modify this. So you know, that would be a bummer, right? Um, return a list containing the names of entries. Ba, ba, ba. I guess I should point out that this is what I'm looking at. Not the number of plugin hosts specifically, but which ones there are, 3.3 .3 and 3.8, because they're all stored in different directories, and we need to have a list of all of the files that we could conceivably open to display in that list. I mean, I guess we need to come in back and edit this at some point, because we're going to use some sweet, sweet, kind information in it when that becomes available. 
but for example, returns a list containing. So uh, the conceivable idea here is that we say lister lib path, for example, um, and then we end up with that. And we might say p for p in that if p dot starts with, hmm. I guess that doesn't necessarily work, does it? The trick is to look at the list of this stuff and pull out only the stuff that you're interested in. which technically is everything that's a folder and not a directory. Whoops, pardon me. I don't think that would work, right? Because I think is dir if it actually exists. Uh, needs a full path and not a relative one. Why can I never remember this stuff? All right, well, I did have that right. All right. Right on. So we would need to conjoin them, if we will, if we wanted to do something. Oh, I guess that didn't work because that um, so it's going to come up with nothing but we would actually need to say os.path.join libpath and p for example and then it would pull out only the directories um, the downside to this of course is that there's no sublime plugin and sublime.py files inside of the python 3 directory So this would have to pull them out of there in a slightly different way. Not the end of the world, mind you. This is the sort of thing that can just sidetrack me no end. I mean, the simplest possible thing to do would be to just take the names of the things that we know that there are, put them in this thing at the top, and then it would just work. But, you know, I like to, I like to problem solve, if you will. Um, so, and then we would probably want, now here's the thing, um, anything that we do here, we kind of want to only do one time. We don't want to do it every time the command is executed. So it would kind of need to have an overall thing. So what if... We said uh, this, right? And then that's the root. And then the lib path is equal to os.path.join of root and lib. And then say, uh, Hosters is equal to P4, well, this thing here. Only that's kind of long, so that's sort of unfortunate. Does, is this the sort of thing that uh, compiles? All right, well, I mean, that's good, right? Uh, we get rid of that, and then we call again just to test it, and we got some stuff going on there. Good. You can also do dir os pat. Yeah, every time I try to do that, I mean, this one's uh, not that uh, shabby, but I try to do something like, uh, and then life goes quickly hairy. Um, it never occurs to me that 
not all of the uh, modules are quite that funky. Actually, this is probably, oh, wait. Another reason why that never is a thing, but uh, that one's definitely got a lot of stuff in it too. But yeah, I keep looking in the documentation in the vain hopes that it's going to remind me of stuff. Downside of this, that doesn't work, um, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be a standard Python thing. Most of my Python experience is in, in here. Um, but that's the stuff. So for path in hosters, you might say got to see how nice this actually looks of course um, of course you wouldn't do that um, we would probably also in that case print this so the return value is just an empty list so what we're going to do here is loop over all of these things. Um, oops. Oops, os.lister, pardon me. I mean, the, the thought also occurs, all things being equal. Um, that if we want this to work everywhere, then what we're doing now is the correct thing. But uh, if we're assuming that we're going to do this in Sublime 4, this would probably be a great time to use the path lib that's now available in favor uh, in absence of this one, but I'm not particularly familiar with that one either. OS.path is something I use so frequently in plugins that dirt OS path is shockingly quicker than going through docs. Interesting. I find that I very rarely do anything file related to the point where even just opening a file and reading lines out of it is one of those things that I haven't quite committed to memory yet. Partially though, I'm going to say partially uh, because I've been a C programmer for so long that uh, every time I want to open a file, I meet my brain immediately wants to type file star bob equals f open uh, and then that doesn't work and then i get into the mindset of i'm pretty sure i know how this works but wait am i thinking of lua or am i thinking of python which is dumb because i'm pretty sure they both work the same way but you know life being what it is lib path and Oh, hey, actually, life is probably a lot easier here than I thought it was going to be. Ah, ha, ha. Um, I kind of forgot what I was doing here. Path. One of the things that we can do in that, and this is something that I guess, uh, Lister, really? Oh, it's straight. It's not in path, right? Um, did it say that we could? No, I guess not. I just had this brain fart that we could uh, probably want something like glob, right? If that's even a thing. Probably not, I guess, or not here, uh, to find basically all of the Python files in this directory. That's probably somewhere in the path directory or such. Or maybe it's its own library. That's definitely something I don't use that frequently. Uh, That's probably what we want here instead of what I was going to do. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, actually, um, let's do this. Oh, actually, I know it has to be a one whole path, doesn't it? Yeah. So probably something like yaw. There is the one for Sublime 3, and there is the one for Sublime 8. Right on. Um, stupidly, I clobbered over that. Um, we probably want something like this. Now the list of files is the list of files that you would expect, which is nice. They're not sorted, mind you. Uh, and if there were any other Python files in either of those directories, they'll just automatically ping in, so that's nice. Just having a little check. Nothing has been reported. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> making sure that there's not a new build. All right, um, so we have the list of files. Let's go ahead and now they're sorted according to the plugin host. Nice. Um, now we do this. Otherwise, we do a yaw. Get plugin files dot files is equal to sorted files, and then return get plugin files dot files. Um, so we would note that we could say. Every time I do this, it says looking up, but that's because the thing is reloading. But if we said from user.openapi import get plugin files, uh, then if we said get plugin files, uh, the first time it says it's, it, now it's saying it's cached every time. So it only needs to do the file walk once the very first time that you call it. Uh, I believe we refer to that as memoizing the results. With that in place, we have a list of all the files that we're interested in. So all we really need to do is do something fancy with them here. Now, the simplest thing to do here would be to return get plugin files <laughs> like this. Uh, and then if we did the thing, uh, Um, hmm. not gonna lie, I'm not, I'm a little confused about why that decided to not work. Oh, right, because there's stuff in here that doesn't need to be. Uh, all right, this doesn't, this shouldn't be here anymore. I forgot. <laughs> So simplistically, that works. Um, could use a little bit of in the usability department, though. Uh, all things told. However, I presume the benefit to uh, doing this the other way is that Unless this works now. Hmm. Uh, 
I was not expecting that to work. I'm not going to lie. And I'm pretty sure in Sublime 3 that doesn't work. Uh, if there's something that's actually associated with a file, it's changing its name has uh, bad side effects. Like I believe this would actually try to, it does, it's trying to save it as something that it's not now. Um, <laughs> which is probably a reason not to do that. But, um, so what do we want this to look like? We would probably want to say 3.3 .3 host and then the name of the a dash and then the name of the file. For example, uh, we don't need to see the whole path. No, sir, we don't. But we don't want to see just the name of the file. Otherwise, you can't tell which one it is that you're trying to open. And we could potentially do something with the preview, but I don't know that that's necessarily that interesting either, all things being equal. Um, yeesh. So the next question would be, yeah, do that here or do that in the place that calls it? Because um, return a list of all of the files that are used to provide the sublime. This covers files from all known, from all available plugin hosts, including those that may not have existed at the point where this plugin was created. Because it's nice to document these things, right? Um, would we do that here? Because this is just going to be a list, um, and we're going to want something different. Um, I'm imagining uh, for my own purposes I would rather that get plugin files just gives you plugin files and anything that wants to beautify that that's their job it's not my job to do it so we might say files equals get plugin files um, and then we could say for file in files but then we need a new list of stuff don't we yeah we might say items is equal to an empty list. Uh, we don't want to, whoa, return this. We want to return items. And I should have duplicated that. One of the things that I did, by the way, is tweak up how the audio is coming across in the stream. So whether I talk quietly or I talk a little bit loudly, the level of the volume on it should be about the same uh, and not blow out. Um, so if you hear any weirdness in the audio, I didn't in the extensive testing that I did, please do let me know. Um, we're going to want something like that. And we'll leave that there for just a second. We're going to need to create a tuple out of this bad boy, and we know it's going to be a full path. Um, I want to check path split because I have a. Is it the same as just assuming you're going to split on the path character? Tail is the last path name component, and head is everything leading up to that. Okay. Um, I think that's probably what we want for this thing. Um, we would say path plugin is equal to os.path.split file. Um, and then mm, The last path component of the directory would be the plugin host, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then host and that is equal to os.path.split of the path. And then items.append a tuple with let's say host and plugin just to test that this is good oh hello Dwayne. thanks for letting me know the audio uh is uh, is good uh, 
it's not quite where I want it to be. I want to apply some equalization to it to make it sound a little bit better, but I still have not cracked how you make OBS under Linux use the VST plugin without instantly seg faulting as soon as uh, a frame of audio appears. So that is a, still an issue. One of the things I'm actually playing with is trying to get this computer to stream my desktop and everything else to a Windows laptop where I would actually have the camera and the headset attached where I could use all of the audio sweetening and uh, some other stuff to make the picture look better too and then have it stream from there. Uh, but, you know, baby steps. I got all the, ch all the videos on my other channel to rewrite. Okay, um, there's a slight possibility that we may have done that incorrectly. Um, I think it was supposed to be underscore host because it's the last part that we care about. Oops, that's not right. Right on. Okay, so, I mean, that's doing what we want or it's doing what the code says. I mean, clearly... We don't actually know what we're going to get. Oh, interesting. That, that, that did not. Uh... Oh, sorry. That should be file. Um, so doing this gets us the thing, but we don't know actually where it is. But um, do we want to say that this needs a new version of the plugin host? I really... You know, if I do it this way, then it will work even for people in sub, pardon me, in Subontex 3, I think. Um, I guess, whoops, Subontex. 3211. Um, really? Oh, sorry. I've been using the new builds too long. I forgot <laughs> they have a slightly different structure. Inside of the lib folder, there isn't one. They're right in the root. Uh. Content before presentation? Hey, hey! One of the things I like to say in streams is make it work, then make it pretty. So I guess uh, I'm extending that to other areas without realizing it. Um, so as written, this will not work in Sublime 3 because it looks in the wrong location. Uh, we could fix that, though. You think it's worth it to have this work regardless of the version of Sublime that you're running? Because all it would really take is um, changing this part here. This needs to work this way for Sublime 4, and it, you just need the executable path and then find all of the Python files inside of it directly, which would be the shortest possible way to pull that off. Um, and then it would work for both. Or... It should work for both. We got that going. So, right on. Um, is that a good presentation? I think it is. So we're going to say if we want that one, and that is definitely the one for Python 38. So that is cool. I think we should... Maybe do a little bit of that bad boy. Um, version, platform, arch, and channel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it works in Sublime 3, good enough. Bless you, sir. Are you okay? 
sneeze factory down here. Currently, it's only going to work in Sublime 4 because of the way that we're looking up stuff here. Um, but yeah, int sublime dot version is going to give us something, right? So. Simplistically, we're going to say 4,000 there, even though the first build is 40, 50. Then do that. Otherwise, oh, actually, pardon me. We want that regardless. Oh, hmm. yeah. Maybe we want to go the other way with that. Uh, no. That theoretically is all that's required to make this work in Sublime 3. Um, so. Builds with multiple hosts. Plugin hosts. So it's Sublime 4. There's, uh, nah, I don't even want to put that document there. There's a lib directory inside of the installation directory. We get the list of all of the places that are there. If it's Sublime 3, then whatever the root folder was, there's just Python files in there. And that should be enough to get that to work. Um, and then we're pretty much done. Um, just double check that it works here. Really? Oh, whoops. We'll just uh, double check that it works here. <laughs> so that's working. Boom, good. Um, and then we would need to actually also open API and If I did that, then uh oh. <laughs> oh, YouTube editor is broken. Sublinet is broken. Uh, I ex I expected that to be the case. Um Pipe text broken. Okay. Um, did I not? Uh, good grief. Oh, right, right, right. Um, let's quit that and restart it because package dev really uh, did a number on the console there. What did I call that thing again? <laughs> Open API. Did I manage to copy it to the wrong place? What the hell, man? Ah, ha, 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 ha. Derpy Derpington. Okay. And oh, ah, we're gonna play it that way, are we? Did I actually use that somewhere? Ah, oh, crunk on a cracker. I guess. We probably want the path equals root in that case. Open API files. And I mean, yeah, 
it's not really the correct thing, but it works. It's going to have a direct, the directory name of wherever you installed it, which is probably going to be Sublime Text 3 under Linux or Sublime Text 3, but with spaces and uppercase under Windows. So I consider that good enough. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of, uh, the only change I made was that, right? Yeah. Oops. We'll go ahead and just uh, plug that here. Oops. I did it the wrong way. Open API files, 38 Sublime. And uh, there we go. So that, my friends, works. And for the purposes of sharing, I'm going to go ahead over here and say, uh, I'm logged in, right? I assume. Why does this window not know? Oh, there we go. Need it thinks it's a mobile window because it's so narrow. <laughs> Sublime plugin API files. What we're going to need is this. Uh, that's going to be open API.py. Um, I guess I'm going to have to do that because this is indented for spaces and looks like yaw. And then this would be default.sublime commands. And I guess we need to reopen that file because I probably closed it, right? User default commands is this one. That was the right. That was the right place. I got a little panicky there. And whoop. ah, son of a bitch. When you make these things <laughs> private, or I was trying to click the other place. Uh, there we go. Sweet. And, and, uh, here's a link. I'll sweep by later after the stream is done to put a link to the video where it came from so people can see how we big brained our way into being able to twiddle open the files. So, uh, the actual goal for this evening was <clears throat> modifying this, which works. I did a little bit of tweaking on it since it was originally written, um, and a couple of other things too, because some of the APIs in those really, really early builds of Sublime uh, for uh, the, the API changed ever so slightly. Um, I'm, I don't think it was a problem in this, uh, but it was definitely in some. And I did a little bit of tweaking in, in all of these. That's uh, I pulled it out into its own project thing. Oh, actually, I guess I could also... Uh, I'm assuming... Uh, whoops. Oh, that'll be, that'll be close enough that I didn't make this private because I don't think it's that, uh, that secret. Mm -mm -mm. This is the code that we're working on right now. And it even has a little readme and a link to the live stream where we actually work and worked work. It did worked on that one. If you would like to see, uh, but the general gist you know, is that you can have a project file, say for example, the one that we're working in right now. And inside the project, you can now add this keys item in here. And inside of here is what you would normally put inside of the key binding file. 
And uh, what we have here is a very specific event listener that says whenever a project is loaded, it will uh, basically pluck out these items here and then save them into a key binding file with, with uh, an additional context added. If the key already had context in it, then this will be added. Otherwise, this whole context section is added to the binding before this part happens, so it works the same either way. Uh, and the context is the special project context with the name of this exact project file, just the name of the file, not the location in which it's stored, at least for right now, um, which means that inside of this file, super T, uh, in theory, would do something, only, um, I may have fiddled around with that in some other locale, um, and this may or may not be the correct thing. Um, and what it actually uh, also does is creates a folder inside the packages folder named after this package, which uh, it assumes is project specific keys. It creates a key maps folder inside of that, which is uh, where this particular file happens to be stored. I'm kind of surprised that that does not seem to be working. I wonder if quick switching doesn't load a plugin. That's not something that I checked. Or alternatively, this thing is broken. Oh, you know what? Uh, it's not symlinked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that that would be the reason for this, I imagine. <clears throat> I forgot the last thing I did. <coughs> Pardon me. When I created that repository was move it out of the packages folder. Let's see there's no no item here. Um, so, oh, look at that. File manager, once again, making life terrible. This is, a, oh, shoot. All right, that's a good catch. That's a good catch. Um, needs to be a, one of those in there. Otherwise... The plugin doesn't load in the correct host. Although I don't know if that necessarily matters. I might have done that on purpose. I might not have. But I think here's the theory. This requires API elements that only exist in build 4000 and beyond. So might as well assume that all new packages should run in the new plugin host and not in the legacy plugin host if we can manage it. Um, so that would mean that this now does uh, as we would expect it to do. <clears throat> but if we were in another window, it doesn't have the project. Uh, that key binding does nothing. It only works inside of this one because there's not any other binding. So that is the gist of how this thing works. There's a couple of things that we could do here. Um, the one that I had in mind was something that we need to decide. How do we want our key bindings to be platform specific? And I think we would look at something like the main menu. Whoops. That's not the key I meant to push. Because the main menu and other such files, let's go ahead and do this, um, has a key named platform that can either say platforms that it should be on or platforms it shouldn't be on. Uh, and then that menu item will either appear or not. And it seems like that would be a neat thing to do for key bindings as well inside of the one file. 
Um, Windows, Linux, and OS X are the keys that are used for this. And I can't remember off the top of my head if this can be a comma separated list or not. So, do I have a playlist for an intermediate beginner to Sublime plugins? Um, not per se, except for probably halfway through the Plugin 101 playlist on my alternate channel, if you haven't already found that one. And I only say halfway through because it starts off assuming that you don't know anything at all about plugin development. So the first bunch of videos are teaching you terminology and stuff. We're just now getting to the part where we're actually just discussing actual um, plug-in-y things in an intermediate uh, kind of way, assuming that we've covered enough of the basics in other videos that I can say, we're working with selections. You need to know about regions. If you don't know about regions, go check the region video. Or this is the video on regions and how they work. And if you're not sure about this stuff, refer to this other video. So in that regard, yes, but they're not in a plugin. They're not in a list, a playlist per se. But I will say that one of the things that I am planning on doing with the channel, uh, both channels, this one and my other one, which should be linked down in the description of here, um, is cleaning that up too. I wanna, I think I have too many playlists there. I wanna focus those in a little bit more. And for some of the playlists, I want them to be flipped in the other direction. Um, if you're familiar with plugin stuff in general, uh, let's see. Uh, inside of this one. Unfortunately, this list is sorted by views and not by number. But we're way down into the 20 or 21s here. I believe, you know, oh, you know what? <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Uh, uh oh, <laughs> I had the same problem on the other, I think um, <laughs> Google changed some stuff. Let's see. Hopefully they didn't break this package just after November when I finished with it. But I noticed um, that the shared credentials that I had stashed uh, stopped working. So let's see. Bunk. Um, and if you remember, if you were watching any of the November videos, um, this used to be an entirely different thing. So I think they may have fiddled with things in an unfortunate way as far as having saved credentials are concerned. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So... All that and it didn't oh it didn't actually flush the cache mm. although it probably should have right this is a complicated little bit of action mm. 14 so yeah Life cycle is the, the next one after the one that you've watched is one where we start getting into information that you need to know. But you could probably jump directly to seven. This is a pretty good one for covering the basics of all the things you're going to hear about, you know, like commands, lists, list input handlers, like we were working on, quick panel, all that sort of stuff. And then moving on from there, how to create a command, how to do the input handlers, which is something that we just covered, uh, and so on. So actually, probably uh, the, I'm misremembering exactly how long it's been that we've been doing this, <laughs> these videos. The first few are a bit of a slog because I wanted to have something to be able to refer back to in other videos for basic information. 
but it would probably be cool to have some sort of um, indication of I don't know what level, as you say, like beginner or advanced. Uh, the nice thing is that now that we've reached a point where all of the terminology and everything is done, we can really start pumping out videos that aren't on any particular sort of topic so much as, you know, a thing like, so you want to know how to edit the content of a buffer, or here's a problem that people have with plugins, you know, like so. Um, so we can we can get into that stuff now in a way that we couldn't before. That's right, we were looking at the documentation. Yeah, jump to video seven and see where that gets you. Though, of course, you know, if, if you want to watch video four, five, and six and increase my watch time on the channel, I'm okay with that too. But, you know, it's more for what you get the most out of it, which is one of the other things um, you'll find is that more recent videos also have a table of contents in them to allow you to skip around. That's another one of those things that is slowly coming to older videos, but I wasn't originally doing it uh, because there, I could have done it, um, but it didn't seem to make a, a lot of sense at the time. And now that the video player actually shows you chapters and stuff, it makes way more sense now than it did then. And uh, we regret at leisure, like how I wish I had taken. Um, oh, good gracious. M more uh, piano lessons when I was a child. Let's. Uh, Oh, that's right. I turned it off because I was recording a video. Uh, da, da, da. Does this have something about platform in it? One of the strings. Oh, all right. Well, that actually makes things a little bit easier. I thought it could be a comma separated list, a button A. So cool. Um, Yeah, table of contents on videos is a lot of work to do. Uh, indeed, it's a lot easier now for videos that I'm creating because uh, I can. The uh, software that I use, Camtasia, allows you to add markers to the thing, and I actually have uh, a plugin that I created for Sublime for editing my video descriptions. It's part of the whole November thing. Uh, where I can, you know, with just one key press, pick up the project and it'll insert the table of contents stuff directly into the file for me. Going back through older videos and, uh, man, if you spend like a couple of years making a video a week, then you can come up with a lot of videos. That is uh, the rougher part of this for sure. Let's go through... time we got here neither there oops pardon me half an hour not too terrible um, we could go uh, a little bit later on this operation so when the plugin loads now uh, key map directory uh, this is something that we covered way back in live stream 57 but uh, key binding files need to be in a package it could be in any package at all, including your user package, uh, but it has to appear somewhere in a package, and it doesn't matter where. Unlike plugins that will only work if they're in the root uh, of the package, that's really, to my memory, the only package resource type that has to be in a specific location. If it's in the root of a package, a plugin is a plugin. If it's anywhere else, it's just a Python file that needs to be imported. Speaking of videos that uh, we can do. Uh, yeah, indeed, I use Sublime to put tables of contents in videos. So um, we might do something like this. Uh, I use the video editing software to create the video, upload it uh, to YouTube via the web page. Once the basic information is in place and it's uploading the file, YouTube makes a stub entry in the channel. And then I can say edit video details. And it shows me a list of all the videos, say, for example, uh, this one using find and replace and a sublime text macro like so. So this gives me 
the title of the video, the body of the video, the tags, and I can see what the thumbnail is. Uh, right now, I don't have a way to update the thumbnail except inside of the browser, but I can type anything I want in any of these, and when I hit save, the thing goes back the other way, and I can say insert table of contents, uh, and then, I mean, I don't know that I have uh, <laughs> an appropriate file here. Mm. Thus, if I was to pick the project now, of course, under Windows, where I do this, uh, this goes directly to the folder where I store all of my projects. So it's very easy to find the appropriate file. And then I hit this and it goes. I guess I probably um, should have deleted that one before I did that. So we could say sample.bloop. This is actually just like a JSON file that is the project file from the actual video editing software, but this pulls it out and plunks this sort of thing in here. This is actually something that we did in a previous live stream. Not the November, all through November we were working on this particular package, uh, but the table of contents thing is something that was actually in one of the other things. Let's see. Guard your eyes. I'm currently live on a different channel. This is the thing that I was noticing early, uh, mentioning earlier. The actual picture that I use for this channel's user, I it used to be this, I changed it to this, but I scheduled this video before I did it, so now it seems to be stuck on that forever, uh, even though this is the newer thing. Now we're... Uh, presumably watching me live or something, but what we're really trying to do is this. Um, I guess I could have done that from my own channel too, come to think of it, uh, but I don't think the videos are actually stashed in here. Playlists is the one we want, and no, good God, no, don't do that. I wanted to look at it, bro. I wanted to view it. But anyway, it's uh, way, way back down in the bottom of Yawn List, before the November videos. I'm just looking here because I would imagine Browsable Command List, uh, somewhere in this area, I can't remember. Pipe Tech Enhancement. Yeah, I would imagine it's somewhere in the vicinity of stuff that happened really close to November. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always know exactly what it is that we're going to do in these things before we dive in. New release? Nope, no new release. <laughs> I'm keeping my eye on it. Um, <laughs> oh, and uh, there's a video there that talks about project-specific keys as well, which is where this particular package that we're talking about here came from originally as well. Um, so we need a place to store the key maps, and because this pro this package is named this, we just create a folder named key maps inside of it and store all of our key maps there. This makes sure that that directory actually exists. Presumably, this would be installed as um, a Sublime package file, in which case this would still create a package folder, but that would be okay. Just given a key binding, it adds uh, an appropriate context. This is the query context, the on query context. This is actually how this thing works. Very simple code for that as well. So it all comes down to this. Actually, there's a couple of things that we could do here. <laughs> You're taking me down a rabbit hole, but that's totally why we're here. Um, there's probably a little lower third that pops up, but part of the, the the main reason why I started doing live streams is because I was getting out of the habit of working on plugins and packages to do other stuff. Uh, and I thought, you know, if I scheduled live streams, then I would be accountable for actually doing stuff and I would be have time dedicated to do it. Of course, in the couple of years since then, uh, pretty much all of my hobby coding has become package development, but I enjoy doing this and it's good practice for creating videos on the other channel. Uh, I like the the back and forth of, you know, if you have a question, I can answer it in a faster way than trying to type it in text or go back and forth in comments in the, in the forum and stuff. 
So So by no means, oh, don't worry uh, about that. That's why the, the one of the lower thirds says, don't worry about uh, about asking a question. That is why we were he why we are here. Does this make it makes a folder for the project, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. So. How this part works is whenever a project is loaded, which includes, uh, by the way, something like this, when this is saved, um, that also counts as a project load, or a, it's technically a reload. Um, this gets the project data out of the window, which, pardon me, is basically a JSON object that is this you don't need to load this file or anything it's just a property of the window this is where we can use the console to play and see this is exactly the uh, information that is available in here although it's you know it's a lot more compact in this particular case is that word wrapped it is isn't it um, this particular file may or may not be being tracked right now, but that's neither here nor there. Um, if it doesn't have any keys listed in it, it doesn't have to do anything. Oh, actually, this, sorry, this is the file. No, there we go. Every time I do this, uh, you can see it saying it's reloading that file. That's because this plugin is regenerating it into that directory. So if this doesn't have any keys, it doesn't have to do anything. It gets the project file name in order to figure out that this is named project specific keys dot sublime project, which it needs for the context that it generates. Um, and then it creates its own key map by taking all of the keys out of here and appending them into that list, which it then stores by Pardon me, creating a folder. So we can see here that the location for this, uh, maybe we could do something a little bit uh, different like yaw. This you can see, incredibly long path. This is the location of the thing inside of this. Uh, so it's not technically correct because of uh, the way the symlink is, has been opened here, but that's okay. Uh, but it creates a folder named for the project and then puts the key bindings inside of it. And that's just to make sure that no matter what, how many projects you have, it will always generate a unique thing. Um, if that's not already a folder, make it one, then it needs to create a file name based on the platform that you're currently on, which is sublime.platform returns one of these three values here. Uh, and then it uh, just creates uh, appropriate file and if there's a problem it currently generates a status message we probably want this to say error generating project specific bindings um, just so you know um, so the last the, what we really want to do here is modify this um, and this is where the, the very last thing that happened. Um, oh, as a matter of fact, being the derp that I am, Livestream 57 is the one where we worked on this. <laughs> I forgot I dug into that to create the readme file. Um, the last thing that we talked about in that live stream where we originally worked on this is how do we want this to work? Uh, because we want, right now, uh, if I was to put this project on Windows, this key binding would be effective. If I put this project on macOS, it would be effective. Here on Linux, it's effective. But what if you wanted to use a slightly different key? Because you know, different platforms have different key things. I, and the thing I mentioned earlier is that uh, Linux, I tend to use super for this, which uh, my keyboard has a Windows key that is the super key. On the uh, Mac there, of course, it has the command key. And you tend to use command keys for things where on Windows, you might use control for that. So if you wanted to have project specific key bindings that override everything else um, except for user specific key bindings which it can't really well like mm, 
can't really override user specific key bindings without putting the files in the user package and even then it's a little sketchy um, there's currently no way to do that so ways that come to mind include making this keys list be a dictionary and then have keys like this so that these are the keys for Mac OS and such uh, but the more sublime way to do this uh, would be to do it the way um, menus do which is to say if we did this we're specifying that this key binding should be for Windows so it shouldn't actually generate this key binding into this file here because this is Linux specific keys um, so what we basically need is this could be Windows, Linux, or OS X, where OS X is all uppercase, which is the unfortunate because these are title case and this is not. Which reminds me that this is something John talked about way back before Sublime 4 came out. One of the questions he asked was, how sad would we be if we changed Sublime Platform to return Mac OS instead of OS X? Um, and the answer was very sad because OS X is... Um, one of the things that appears <laughs> in these file names. There's a ton of packages out there. You didn't want to have to try to have it automatically redirect to files with the wrong thing in it. So that change never actually ended up happening. Uh, but ideally what we want here is for... Um, this part to not just say for key and keys append it, but for key and keys, if this has no platform or if it has a platform and it matches, add it to the key map. Otherwise, don't. And then still do this part anyway. Um, so that if you were to modify this like the way I just did here to say I don't want this to be everywhere I want it to be Windows only and I'm on Linux right now, when the project loads, it'll create an empty key binding file. Uh, that doesn't have that binding in it anymore otherwise it would just keep carrying over and confuse the hell out of you so we want to do this so there's a couple of things we need to do here this part will actually be a lot nicer um, I'm gonna do just a very quick from I think I'm experiencing that thing that people were, someone was mentioning. Hmm. Weird. Uh, trying to find by user is not actually working. Trying to find something that John wrote without being able to search for John uh, is an unfortunate turn of events, all things being equal. So that might not be the easy to actually track at this particular juncture. Um, hmm. I'm only looking here uh, because he had, a, I thought, a fairly elegant solution to... do the conversion but I may be misremembering oh here it is right here I'll bring it over so everyone can view he was looking into renaming OS X to Mac for various resources in an upcoming sublime build Sublime Platform will still return OS X on Mac unless the plugin has opted into the updated API, which would be in the plugin 3.8 plugin host. Uh, plugins that use these things would not find them. Oh, it's in default settings.py. Right on. Oh, I see. Well, after all that, he totally did the thing that I would have done anyway. 
So okay. Um. Platform is one of the things that will work regardless. So. I'm going to do this. Um, basically, this just takes the Sublime platform and converts it into the thing, which I guess is what I was doing down. Oh, I wasn't quite doing that down here, but I could make this a little bit nicer. Um, I could swear that, that there was a slightly different thing that he was doing there, uh, but uh, apparently not. So platform name is the thing that we're interested in. And interestingly, this is going to give us the value that we need for what it is that we're trying to do based on this. OS X, Windows, and Linux. It's going to look just like that. Okay. So one thing that we could do to make this nicer is... this which should still work if that's what the key binding file looked like now and I save the project then we could actually see it uh, reload there I don't know if it actually showed up in the stream but the uh, the mark jumped there could actually even make this slightly cooler than that. Uh -huh. Hello, Ben. Uh, going uh, not too bad, considering it's been a while. I mean, a couple of weeks since the previous live stream. I'm actually using OBS 26.1.2, which I got to compile out of the box without having to twiddle around the code. And I even got the virtual camera working as well, which is pretty interesting. Um, the only thing is that if I try to interact with something that uses preferences and the preference wants to open a file dialog, there are 50-50 odds that it will just crash out from under itself. Um, which I believe is a known problem because some of the stuff uses GTK for its file stuff and some of it uses QT and for some reason that causes stuff to get out of sync in the core or something. I remember reading a big thing about it in the OBS uh, thing. It was the reason why the f web browser plugin wasn't automatically supported out of the box on Linux for a long period of time because... Chromium uses GTK and everything else was using QT and they didn't want to use GTK or QT for one dialog box because it had a slightly different way for picking a file or one of those things there. I'm not that interested in uh, how user interfaces work, but so far pretty good. Um, we've had a few of these. <laughs> Why would you mix QT and GTK indeed? Yeah, it uh, it doesn't go well. I, I know that much. And I think they were trying to fiddle-faddle stuff around to make it not be an issue. I can't quite remember the details of it. I would have thought that they actually resolved it because uh, for the longest time I had a browser plugin, but I had to manually compile it, and then I lost the source for the version that I had, so I was very carefully shepherding the shared object file. But now it just part of it and it actually works a lot better I can actually control audio in the thing now in a way that I couldn't before um, oh oh <laughs> why would you mix QT and GTK I don't know that uh, that's crazy <laughs> little little something else that I'm working on there unfortunately you got to really uh, get your head into the right part of the frame in order to have the uh, full effect and the I'm not entirely enamored with the sound effect, but, you know, incremental steps. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting very, well, was it the two hour? Yeah. We're revisiting a, a plugin that we did way back in live stream 57 for project specific key bindings. Um, we're listening for the on load project. Uh, 
API item, and then uh, if the project contains a keys item, it will plunk out a key map inside of the package file with the keys and a custom context that makes them only apply in Windows where that particular project happens to be open. Um, which works pretty good. Um, what we're adding in here uh, is the idea of being able to specify the platform that the thing should be on. And I'm always slightly saddened at how I like these files to have spaces in them, but uh, tabs keep getting in there in a weird way. There we go. Mm. So what we really need is some sort of key filter type action here and everything else to just automatically fall out the way one might like, right? I'm trying to think of the nicest way to do that, the simplest way to do that. Um, now things told, this is not a lot of code for getting this much action out of it. Uh, that's gonna be all the stuff we need. According to the documentation, the platform key in menus can only be either the name of a platform or not the name of a platform, which I guess makes sense because if you wanted it to only be on one, you'd specify it. If you don't want it to be on a particular platform, you could specify that more than once, right? Presumably. Um, that's as documented anyway. Uh, just to verify this, that is the key. Okay. Um, I guess we would probably do a little something like yaw, just to make this look a little bit nicer. Um, we'll go down here. something like this, right? So if there is the platform uh, isn't there, then go ahead and go. Oh, actually I could probably want to say maybe we do it a different way. Do something like this. Um, if platform is none, it just falls directly through to true. That makes that code a little bit nicer to look at. Um, now, oh, you know what I should have added? I should have added a Jeopardy think music button. And then I might get myself dinged for copyright claims. But there's basically two situations here, right? Uh, the platform either starts with a thing or it doesn't start with a thing. Um, want something like this. I always have to do that to make sure that I remember how the string slice operation works. <laughs> I pine for the weird days of C string handling and how absolutely awful it would be to just pluck substrings out of another part of a string and make sure you're not overrunning a buffer. Um, yeah, okay, so. Our platform is this one. So return platform. 
it's not equal to platform name else theoretically something like so so right now this key binding thinks oh we should actually uh, let's say we pop that <laughs> So that it doesn't end up in the key binding, just because that's a little bit nicer. So right now this key binding thinks that it's only available for Windows. So if I do that, this doesn't have any keys in it anymore. If I said it's not Windows, then it does appear. And if I said it was OS X, then it doesn't appear. But if it was Linux, then it does appear. So that's not too shabby uh, as fixes go that's a pretty simplistic one I can't help but think that these four lines could be slightly more Pythonic in some fashion One also wonders uh, Is there a window close? There is, isn't there? Theoretically, I guess one other thing that this could actually do is if a window is closing and it has a project associated with it, it could remove the key bindings that it created just to keep it clean. That seems like a nice-ish way to go, right? Ah. Is there a cool way to do this? <laughs> Is this something that's actually built in? I assume so. Whoops. Oh, that's on the wrong desktop now. Right. Don't Let's hide that up. All right, technically that works, although I'm more than a little creeped out about the potential of blowing away files. <laughs> Platform is not equal to no. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm trying to think about it uh, roundabout in uh, a slightly different way, but. <laughs> Platform is not. Hmm. I actually like that as a magic thing. The platform is not equal to. Whoop, doop, doop, doop. Thus. That almost makes it seem like this totally shouldn't be its own method, you know? But, uh, eh. That, this bit already seems like it's a little bit longer than I technically like things to be anyway. Although I guess maybe I'm getting a false sense of that because this isn't the resolution that I normally run my screen at. But I, I tend to balk at things where... You don't need to check for none either. Can you concatenate? Oh, I guess not, right? Concatenating with none just uh, probably does nothing. I've never done that before. Hmm. Or alternatively, that could conceivably get cranky. <laughs> Unless I did something wrong there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I did because that's not the uh <laughs> that's not the thing it was concatenating with. Right. 
So that's never going to be none. I like it. That's super tight. Now I feel extra bad about creating a method for the thing. I was expecting it to be slightly more involved than that, all things being equal. It always seems weird to me to have none and not check to see if something is and is not none. Maybe I've been doing too much JavaScript lately and getting all creeped out about stuff. <laughs> but as I was saying before, I... I split this out partially because this is getting to be kind of long and I, one of my informal metrics on something is if a method is so big that you can't see it all on the screen at once, it needs to be factored apart and this is getting dangerously close. And I kind of thought that that would be more complicated than it turned out to be with its two-liner. Uh, but also, this is a larger font size and a smaller screen resolution than I normally work at, so I'm getting an artificial sense of exactly how big this might actually be. I would have a lot more space hanging off the bottom. So, that's actually... I could uh, just plunk both of those up here, huh? If you wanted a one-liner, you can use the walrus operator. Oh, that's – isn't the walrus operator the thing that caused Guido to start working for Microsoft instead of Python? <laughs> or is that the, uh, the big argument that caused him to decide that he didn't want to be part of coming up with decisions anymore in his own language? There are some there are some levels to which I will not stoop uh, in order to get things a little bit smaller. <laughs> also, every time I type pop, I kind of want to type poop. <laughs> Linux, not Linux. Testing seems to indicate that that is all to the good. That is a pretty minor change. So the question then becomes, do we want to notice when a project is closing and delete the folder that we uh, plunked out in here? Just uh, to keep project-specific keys a little, bit, uh, a little bit tinier. I don't think that necessarily matters for the ten general case. It was the argument itself, not what the argument was about. Oh, the fact that they were actually angry that or he was unhappy that he made the decision or that the comp the community was so split on it it seems like such a weird thing to argue about one way or the other but then again I can remember a lot of conversations in the lua mailing list that would get variously heated as different uh language lawyers decided what was and was not the right sequence of four characters to make something happen. Never underestimate the passion of a nerd. I mean, not me. I'm not sure that I'm passionate about technology in that kind of way, except that I'm not a fan of Node.js, but I'm still writing code in it, so we got that going on. Um, That's one thing we did. Um, yeah, maybe we will uh, <laughs> leave that part well enough alone. And Hello, Stream Elements bot. I forgot you were here. <laughs> um, stage that and say what we're doing is uh, cool. 
Guido was actually in support of adding the walrus operator. Oh yeah, that's what I mean. I, I assume that he was. He, it was a. Th and again, my recollection of it is vague because it's been a while since I looked at it. But my recollection was he thought it was a good idea and added it, and then various people were really, really against it, and they argued a bunch, and then that was the thing that made him decide that he didn't want to be in charge of decisions anymore or something because because of that particular thing i was only i was being facetiously hyperbolic when i said that's the reason why he left python to go work for the enemy instead but i don't actually know what he's doing at microsoft actually but Sweet. Is it worth cleaning up this folder on window close or would we oops, perhaps want to maybe have a command to clean it up? I'm not entirely sure where I lie on that one. But. Hmm. That's probably going to require a little bit more thought. And I can't think of anything besides those two things that I wanted to do in this particular thing. So we might be done fiddling with this for now. And since it's two and a bit hours into the stream, we might be... Oh, wait, what's this? Hmm. Oh, there was a bit of misinformation around at the time that he left because the community decided to add it. <laughs> ah. And I don't remember. I don't follow. I actually feel kind of guilty sometimes when you know, someone will pop into the Discord and be like, ooh, there's like a new preview out or check out this new pep for something exciting. And I'm like, I do not follow Python enough to to track those sorts of things. Although the my phone is getting better at showing me Python related things and Zelda related things because apparently I've been looking at things I'm uh, various uh, Zelda things a little bit too much lately. I'm imagining I'm going to start seeing articles for retractable dog leashes cuz ours crapped out on us this morning and I had to google around a bunch to find a replacement cuz our local pet store does not have the good brand. So now I'll be getting recommendations on Facebook for BuzzFeed articles of you won't believe what people do with their retractable leashes or some weird thing. Um, I think for our purposes here, uh, based on how I am uh, still incredibly tired, we should probably, I think, call the stream here. Uh, we got a fair bit of stuff done. And uh, back up in the chat uh, a ways, there's a link to the other thing that we did uh, here. If you happen to have jumped to the end of this operation, we created uh, a plugin uh, that automatically finds all of the plugin files for whatever version of Python or of Sublime that you're running and then quickly opens it up for you in a read-only view. So if you need to quickly zoop around uh, and find stuff, you can do so without having to manually open it, uh, which uh, I created for my own purposes and then shared into gist because uh, Ashwin uh, also likes to do the same thing. It's kind of come in handy when we start modifying HyperHelp as well to uh, have some of the newer help in it. I'm not entirely sure what actually is missing here. But we're looking at potentially uh, in the next stream or later, either augmenting this to have an on pre closed window handler that undoes what this one does, or just a command that cleans up the list of key bindings that this thing is creating, just to make life a little bit nicer for people that cycle projects around. I guess because theoretically you could delete a project and then create a new one with a different name. No, I guess that wouldn't be a problem. Anyway, 
Um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, call the stream here. Thanks so much, everybody, for showing up. And I'm going to press the button here to do this. This is a uh, red letter stream uh, because I managed to stay awake the whole time. We got a bunch of stuff done. Uh, OBS didn't crash. So three for three uh, on that one. That is uh, quite cool. Um, and I think if we were to double check here now that we're near the end stats say that we only dropped 49 frames due to rendering lag which is not too shabby and it turns out has everything to do with me clicking and dragging a window because uh, OBS seems to be a tiny bit unhappy about how when I move a window around it becomes completely translucent uh, doing that at 30 frames a second and also capturing the screen possibly a little bit more than my system can handle. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Remember, you can uh, subscribe to the channel with the link down below and ring the bell notification icon. You'll know when we're going live and down in the description of the channel, which is or the video rather, which is uh, new for this stream and, you know, retroactively will roll back through other streams. There's a link to my other channel uh, where we do uh, weekly videos of a not live but more planned nature still in the vein of Sublime Text plugin development. Thanks everybody for uh, watching uh, live and uh, hanging out in the chat and uh, see you uh, in the next live stream, which should be next Tuesday. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to fall asleep on the couch with the dog and the treats again. I mean, probably. I'm not saying never. I just mean on, on stream night. You know how it is. <laughs> Bye everyone.